So welcome, Mark. I'm always excited to have somebody who's doing something innovative with books on the show. Thank you for having me back on the show. I enjoyed our last conversation. I'm excited to talk about this new project. I am too. So you guys, I mentioned a little bit in the intro that Mark is the creator of Brain Bump. And it is a new app that he has put a lot of effort into. He saw a need in the marketplace. So tell us a little bit about what you saw and why you built this. I read a lot of business books. Now, I wrote a business book. I've read a lot over the years. And one thing I've always hated, I read a book. I say, wow, this is great. So many useful ideas. And then you forget them all two weeks later. (laughs) That's not good. As a reader, I want to remember this. And I wish there was a way to do so. Now, I take notes on my books, and many people do. But even when you take notes, you never go back and look at them again. You forget to do that. Or the notes aren't there when you need them. So, for example, I have networking tips in my book. When do you need those tips? You read them sitting on your couch. And then two months later, you're at a networking event, you're at a conference, and you say, what was it Mark recommended? (laughs) You need those tips then and there, but they're not accessible. Now, once I became an author, I saw this same need from the other side. Well, I want word of mouth marketing. We all know that is the best type of marketing you can get. But if you don't remember my book and what's in it, you're not going to be recommending it to my friend, to your friends. So how do I get you to remember the book so you can recommend it? And so these two problems actually have the same solution. Now, it also turns out, as you and your audience know well, It turns out most people who write business books or self-help books in general, they have other products and services they want to sell. You don't make money from books, right? (laughs) This, I'm sure you tell your audience, like, don't think I'm going to sell a million books and be rich. You're saying, well, I'll get the books out there and then people will come back for other things. But there again, you have to go through the process of no like love. Someone will spend $20 today to check out your book. They're not going to buy a $500 or $2,000 service right off the bat until they get comfortable with you. And that takes time. And that means they have to get repeated exposure to why you are good. And so this same tool also solves that problem. So I saw this big hole in the market. Interestingly, I didn't plan to build this. I thought someone must have built this. I'm just going to go license the tool. It didn't exist. I happen to be a technologist. I'm a CTO. I build tech startups. So I filed a patent around it and then began building the app. That is so cool. I can't even imagine building an app. So I a lot of respect to you there. I tech tech is like stereo instructions to me. I just look at it and go, oh. Um, so you're getting out there and you're getting exposure for your book. But why is that any different than social media? We are inherently different than social media in a few ways. If you think about social media, it's good for some things, but not for what we want to do. First, as the content creator, oh, I have to post again today because I posted yesterday or the day before or last week, but no one's looking at your post from two months ago, unless you said something really stupid, in which case you're getting (laughs) attacked for it. But you might have had a really great idea that still applies today, that applies two years from now, it's evergreen content, but no one's looking at your post from two months ago. They're only looking at your post today. So you constantly have to post something new. And that means daily effort, or maybe you're using a a posting planner, but still it's a lot of repeated effort. It's also something that it has to be timely now. And if you think of that, if today I have a tweet going out at 3.17 p.m. with some advice, let's say advice on how to hire someone, Most people who are following me, they're not in that moment thinking, oh, I have to hire someone. I need advice on this. So my advice that I push out falls on deaf ears. It's not relevant to most of them. Rather, we want the user to have a poll experience where they say, I need to hire someone. What do I need to know? I'm about to walk into that conference. I need the networking tips now. So you want that poll experience where it is relevant to the user at that moment and your content will resonate so much better the other thing again social media because it's time oriented so we don't look at what's two months ago with my app once you put the content on there it's going to be surfaced every day to someone 
who finds it relevant in that moment. So I don't have to think, oh, I got to post every day. Once I upload the content for my book, I'm done. I don't have to go back and do more each day. The system automatically delivers it to the people who are looking for that at that moment. Oh, wow. So the algorithm, just if I, what, what is the mechanism that says I'm looking for that? Or can you share that? Is that a trade secret? <laughs> I, I can. Of course, the algorithm, I'm going to talk in high terms, and it will get more sophisticated over time, as they all do. But it's very simple. The user starts by saying, I'm interested in this content. Now, you hear me talk about content, not books, because we support books, blogs, podcasts, classes, and talks. Mm -hmm. They're all kind of the same. It's about information. There's useful ideas. It's just, is it written? Is it audio? But you take the key ideas and the user says, I've either read this book or I've heard this podcast, or I heard about it from a friend I want to explore. So they're going to add that piece of content to their app. Once they do, when they add the content, they're getting not the entire book, not the entire transcript of the podcast. They're getting the key ideas that the content creator put on there. So you're getting all these tips. And in this sense, it's a little like a flashcard app in this moment that you have all these cards with the key ideas. And the user then can filter either by searching for a key term or we let you tag the tips. So tips from my book, I have a chapter on networking. All of those are tagged networking. I have a chapter on leadership. All of those are tagged leadership. So the app user can say, I want leadership tags. I'm looking in Mark's book and I want leadership tips right now. They can select by that filter. Or they could even say, you know what? I want leadership tips. I don't care if it's from Mark or if it's from Carol or Chris or Zach. So I've got all their content. I just want leadership tips from any of them. And then your content will come up along with others. And hopefully your content will be seen as the valuable one that they really like. So we're going to let the best content win. Oh, that's very cool. So this goes into you have to be a content creator. And that's what so many authors miss is, you know, they haven't been building that content. What would you say to them? Share the book? Because their book is a whole, you know, library of content. I couldn't even find the word there. It's a whole bunch of information. So is the book the best thing to use or mix it up? I would first say, don't think of yourself as an author or a speaker or a blogger. You are a content creator. You have ideas. You can convey them in different mediums. You can conveniently package them together as a book. You can post on social media every day. Hey, look at this idea. Here's another good one. You can go on podcasts. You can give talks. We've mentioned before, you don't make money from the book. So while a lot of authors do, you have the book but then you draw people further in by having maybe a weekly blog, or maybe you sell yourself as a consultant, as a speaker, or doing workshops where you're conveying more information and getting a better profit margin on that. But it's the same idea. So what I have in my book, you can buy it for $20, but you can also hire me, I'll talk to your company, and that's where I can charge more money. But I didn't have to come up with completely new ideas. I took the existing ideas, and I repackaged them from the book to the talk. So think of yourself as a content creator. You might put in a book, you might put in other formats. You'll talk about it when you go on podcasts or the radio, you'll use it in your talks and workshops, and you can put in this app as well to help deliver the message. Now the philosophy in the app, someone who says $20 is really pricey, maybe they're gonna say, I'm just gonna use the app because I can get some of the ideas, I don't have to buy the book. Those people were not going to hire me for $500 or $2,000. So I'll lose a couple book sales, but I'm going to gain that word of mouth marketing. I'm going to gain that brand recognition with my target market. And I think that's a worthwhile trade-off. So the app is really about the nurture phase in marketing. So, absolutely. Yeah. So that, and you're absolutely right. You guys, if somebody is looking for free stuff, they're not your people. You're, you're in business to monetize, bottom line. So I love what you said about that because if somebody's in there to just get free tips, well, that's fantastic. But your goal with the nurture phase is to bring people into those higher ticket items. And um, so let me ask you this. Is there a way, let's say that I like what I'm seeing on the app 
how do I go from that nurture phase into, you know what, I might want to have a conversation and build a relationship with Mark to work with him. The app takes the tips and they are all hyperlinked back to your content. So if someone sees a tip and says, that's a really good idea. And you know, I've seen a number of tips. Well, they can just click into the cover image and go right to your website. Or maybe they say, hey, that's a good idea, but I want to learn more. And they'll click the title that will take them to the blog post or the podcast episode to go deeper into that particular idea. And of course, they're seeing your content every day because one of the things that the app allows for, we've talked about this, oh, I need those networking tips right now, so I'm going to go pull them up. But you can also set it up so that each day you get that push. What do I mean by that? Suppose I'm a new manager. I just got promoted. I'm a new manager. Ooh, I don't know much about managing. So every day at 9 a.m., I want to get a tip pushed to me about being a manager. So each day I chose 9 a.m. because it's right as I walk in the office. If this was about having a successful marriage, maybe I'd said for 6 p.m. right as I come home from work. So I'm going to set the time that works for me with the right topic that works for me at the time. So each day I see that little, oh, here's a management tip. Good, good. I'll keep that in mind. And each day I get that one. But of course, when I want to go further, I click through and I go to your website, to your particular post, and I can follow up there. There's also ways I can follow you on social media because we'll link to your social media links. So we direct people to you. And in fact, here's another difference from social media. Social media wants to keep you on the app. Twitter and Facebook, they, their algorithms say, oh, if you're not continuing to scroll, the content's not good. The usage model for Brain Bump, you should be on it for a couple seconds each day. You get that tip, you say, great idea. Either you close the app or you say, now I want to go to the content creator's website. We want you off the app quickly. We don't want you just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling because it's this quick hit. So it's that little Brain Bump to keep it top of mind. Oh, that's so cool. I wonder where you got that name. Okay. So what are the advantages here for the content creators? Because I think that's where people are really like, why this? I do, I have content in so many places. Why this? We always teach you, take your content and repurpose it. Yes. It's the act of creating content that's hard. That takes work. Once you have it, don't just say, well, I put in my book, now I'm done. Turn it into the talk, put it on social media. So you've got the content. We're just asking you to reformat. And in fact, when you go through and create this list of tips, now that might take a little effort. You have to go through your book, pull it out. It usually takes people just a few hours of work. But first of all, that list of tips, well, these are your social media posts for the next six months. You've done the work. It's your content. Reuse it. Get the most out of it. But the key thing, what makes the ROI really good is, again, you invest those few hours to create that tip set and put it on the server. And now you're done. With my social media, every day I have to make sure I am tweeting or I have to schedule ahead of time. But with the app, once I upload the tips from my book in the app, I never have to go back to it again because each day I know those tips are being delivered to some user who wants that content at that moment. So it's a fire and forget. There's a little work up front, but then you don't have to go back each day as you do with social media. Yeah, and for those of you who've actually worked with us and had a bestseller campaign, we actually have you create those 10 key tips that you know. So you've got those already. In addition to Chris reading and giving you a reader perspective, because we always have our authors do it and then come in with a reader's perspective on it as well. So if you're working with us already, you've got 20 tips right there that you can work with and you don't have to go back through your book right away, but you should be, as you're reading your book, getting those, those tips out of there as well. So and, you can be proactive with that. An easy thing some people are doing is they're getting a worker off of Fiverr or Upwork or one of those offshore models or you can find, maybe you have an intern, maybe you just have a friend, and you say, listen, can you go through my book and highlight it? So when they get someone off of Fiverr, they say, here's $50, $80, read my book, I'm gonna send you a Kindle version, and just highlight what you think is a key idea, what you think is interesting, and then you just export all those highlights, put it in the spreadsheet, upload it to the server, very easy. So for either a couple hours of time of yourself or someone on your staff, 
or you pay $50, $80 to someone overseas, you can generate scores of tips that will make your book look incredibly rich and valuable. Yeah, you could do that with the podcast you put there as well. Um, we use Podetize, which comes with a blog or a written article. There's no reason why you can't send that article out to someone at Fiverr or Upwork and do exactly the same thing that, that, that Mark is talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't have it done already, if you're not yet using Podetize, which is a great service, what you can do is just get a transcription service and upload a whole bunch of audio files Mm -hmm. And then you get the raw transcript. It's not nicely formatted yet, but still that's enough where, again, you get that person somewhere in the, in the world to just skim through it and pull out the key ideas. So yeah. it's very and, easy to generate. Yeah. And all these by ideas. the way, we actually do that. Uh, Sarah, our content person is, is out for a family emergency right now. And um, that's what we've been doing with our podcast for our magazine articles is we'll get it transcribed and then we'll kind of cut and paste out of there and segue to, you know, whatever we need to do for the articles. So it does make it super easy and super easy to repurpose because all you have to do is cut and paste. <laughs> and even if you're not going to use Brain Bump, do this anyway. Take your content and repurpose it and get it on social media or turn that podcast into a blog post. You've done the hard work creating the content just reformat and get so much more value out of it. Exactly. And we also, too, when we talk about repurposing content, we always talk about there are three main learning modalities. There's no reason why you can't present the same content in all three modalities to pick up a bigger audience as well. So people say, but I have somebody I golf with all the time that says, go watch Phil Mickelson. He's got this chipping you know, and I'm just like, I don't learn from video. I need to be there and doing. So you just never know how people learn. And it doesn't hurt to repurpose in ways that that everybody can put in their learning modality and pick up what you have. So what is the advantage for the app user? The app user. So this isn't you, the content creator. This is the end user. The app user can get exposure to your content quickly and easily in a convenient way. Because again, our books, there's great advice, but the advice doesn't apply to when they're sitting on the couch reading it. It applies in the field at a time and place different than when they access the book. So this puts the key ideas of your content in their pocket. I say books, but books, podcasts, blogs, talks, puts in their pocket so they get when and where they need it. And that makes your content so much more valuable. It's great to read about an idea three months ago and hope you remember it. It's even better that that idea is at your fingertips and you can use it right now when it's relevant. So they're going to get that benefit of making your content more actionable. And of course, they'll associate that with your brand. Yes. And here's an idea for those of you out there. If you're like me, I, I'm a big Audible listener. Like I should own Audible as much as many downloads as I have a month. Um, but I will listen to a book. And if it's something I find valuable, I'll go buy the book as a resource. But I'm looking at Brain Bump and saying, well, wait, do I really need to go buy that book, even though that that hard copy, physical copy, if I've got, if I can go to Brain Bump and get those key points out of it that I need for whatever I wanted to use it for. So, you know, I've already purchased the book on Audible. Maybe now I don't need to go purchase it in physical form. I'm a bookseller. I should never give you guys ideas like that. <laughs> well, no, here's the thing. Well, it might sound like, wait a second, I'm losing a second sale. <laughs> to your point, that extra $10, $20, again, that's not how you're making your money. Yeah. But what's happening, you're saying, this is so valuable. I want to see the content again. Now, if you buy the book, okay, they made a few dollars in royalties, but the book sits on your shelf and do you remember to look at it again or remember to look it up? But when it's in the app, it's so much easier, so much more accessible that you will be looking it up, not once every three months when you happen to be in your office with the book, but every week or two, you're like, oh, right, that tip, let me look it up again. Or you get surface to you. And you get so much more engaged with the content. You build a stronger relationship with the brand, which was the ultimate purpose of the book anyway, not to get the extra $2 in royalties from selling it <laughs> twice. So this is 
this is going to increase your engagement with the book, which is our ultimate goal anyway. Yeah. And I love that Mark keeps pushing that that idea home because we're very transparent with people. Your ROI is not going to come from this book. If you break even, you are a really lucky author with book sales. It, it almost never happens. It's what you do with that book. And this is a great way to be able to nurture people into those next steps where your ROI does come from. So um, very, me, very good idea. Let me give you an example. Many of us who write business books or self-help books, we do talks. We get brought in by companies or conferences and come in and do a talk. Now, the way you're evaluated is first at the end of the talk are people applauding or booing. Usually they're polite. They're not going to boo, but you'll get some initial sense. You know, is the polite, pl polite applause or is it sincere or do people seem excited about it? OK, that's great. That's usually all they really do. You might have the smile sheets rate me one to five. But now imagine because this is what I get. I get two weeks later, the person who brought me in says, your talk is so compelling. Everyone is still talking about two weeks later. I can't believe that. Now, here's why they do that. On my final slide, where you say thank you and you have your contact information, I've got my contact information. I also put a special QR code to my content on the app. Each piece of content on the app, when you put your content on there, you get a unique link and QR code. So I put that QR code on the final slide. I say to the audience, thank you. If you have questions, here's my contact information. By the way, would you like to remember everything we talked about? Pull out your phone, snap that QR code. Now I snap it the first time. They probably don't have the app installed, but that's okay. That special link takes them to a page where they download for Android or for iPhone. Mm -hmm. I say, okay, now you have installed, snap it a second time. That instantly adds the content. So what I did in two snaps, they've just added all the tips from the talk I just gave them. And now every day they're gonna get a little reminder of one of the things they learned. So two weeks later, the person who hired me says, your content really resonated. Well, yes, because I'm reminding everyone every day about it. I don't speak that part, I know it in my, in my mind, but they think I'm a genius. And so these little things help us really create a lot more ROI and that of course leads to being brought in again for different content or being recommended to their peers at other companies. Yes, and that is the best way to get yourself booked for workshops over and over is that, that recommendation. So how hard was it to build this system? I've always been curious about an app. Now you'll probably say, oh, I'm an MIT grad or professor, so it was easy. But for the, for the layman, how difficult is it? I'm an MIT grad and I teach there and it was hard. Oh. <laughs> now I have done software for 25 years. I'm not an author primarily. This is something I do because I enjoy it. It's based off a course I teach, but I have been building tech startups from the dot-com era up till today. Whenever you do a project like this, it is a lot of work because you have to come up with your designs then you have to implement it. And there's always problems, there's always bugs, there's always challenges. Then you find the design, oh, it's not quite right. And for apps especially, no one reads the instructions for the app. So you have to make sure everything <laughs> is super intuitive. And we've gone round after round. I show it to people, say, okay, let me, here's the app. What do you do? What's confusing? I watch them try to do things and what's obvious, what's not? And then how do we tweak that? And then still more bugs and then challenges even getting into the app stores. Mm. When you have an app, you have to get approved by Apple and by Android. And I can tell you one of the two is very easy. One of the two is known to be a nightmare. They held us up for two months. We did everything right. We're not stealing personal data. In fact, we don't even collect the user data. We're not doing bad things. We're not doing stuff to the system. They said, yeah, no, we don't think this is interesting enough we're not going to approve it. Mm -hmm. And I had to go through rounds and rounds explaining, this is unique, this is different, this doesn't violate your terms. This does what these other apps you already admitted do, but more, why are you laying them in but not me? It was a nightmare gang through them. 
So you have so many challenges. It's like doing a book, except you have lots of other people coming in and kibitzing and rejecting you for reasons they won't explain. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I love that. I love rejection. No, um, but I, I am going to point out something here. I want you guys who are thinking about building an app to think about just like with a book, there's a reader journey and many authors will start building the book without the buy-in from the reader journey, from the readers understanding what those readers want. It's the same thing with an app. You have to have the buy-in and have a journey prepared that will keep people engaged in using this. So there's that. I think that is the biggest thing I heard when I was trying to build an app was that, um, you know, I, I was really concerned about how the users would see it, especially since I'm a tech idiot. So, um, you know, it had to be easy enough for me to use. When I did my book, I sent out early drafts to people. Some were in my target audience. Some were people who were experts like me and just to make sure, hey, did I screw up explaining this or did I forget something? And I discovered subtle but important things. Now, I mentioned my book was based on the class I've been teaching for years. So when I wrote my book, I would literally sit at my keyboard and think, okay, imagine my class is in front of me. What do I tell them? I just start typing out what I would say to them. But what would happen is I use words like students or your first job because I'm teaching students. The advice about leadership, about networking, this is not just for college students, not just for recent grads, but I would slip into using a term like a student or an internship. And some of my readers caught that and said, this sounds like it's just being written for people in school or just out. Mm -hmm. So oh, catch. I had to change it and make it make the verbiage different. The content was good. The verbiage had to change. And so this goes to your reader experience that you want. How does a reader perceive this? Not just is your content good, but how are they perceiving the content? Is it organized the way they like to receive it? Is it phrased in phrases they will recognize and relate to? So it's very important to get that feedback. Yeah. And for, for an app as well, when I was in advertising, perception is reality and it's not what you think about your brand. It's what everyone else thinks about your brand. And so it's the same in, in all of this, the app building, it's the, the book, everything reflects that. And you have to remember that. Um, that, that is one of my big pet peeves is small businesses who don't do their market research. Cause of course we had, you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars we put into market research at, at Shia Day. But I, I realized the, the, the little guy doesn't have that, but there are ways that you can create that reader journey and connect with them. So where do we find this app? Where can we go grab it and take a look at it and, and think about getting on it? If you go to brainbumpapp.com, it will either be on that page or we might redirect you to another page. There you'll see where you can go find the app. It's in the Android and Apple store and we'll have it linked from there. So you can just go to that page and then click right through. We'll also have a link if you're a content creator and want to learn more about having your content on the app, there will be a form you can fill out there. And then you and I can have a conversation. We can talk about getting your content on there. So brainbumpapp.com. Great. Thank you so much for being a guest today, Mark. Thanks for having me on the show.